Good afternoon and welcome to Conway Hall's Thinking on Sunday. Today we'll be talking about Northern Ireland, the fragile piece. I think probably anybody who keeps an eye on the news realises that it is a fragile piece. And we're very lucky this afternoon to be able to speak to Professor Fergal Cochrane. Fergal is an Emeritus Professor of International Conflict Analysis and a Senior Research Fellow at the Conflict Analysis Research Centre, University of Kent. He's the author of Breaking Peace and Migration and Security in the Global Age and co-author of Mediating Power Sharing, Northern Ireland, The Fragile Peace, was published in March 2021 by Yale University Press. Over to you, Fergal. Thanks very much, Deborah. And uh, I'd just like to say a big thank you to uh, Conway Hall as well for hosting us. Uh, I'm just going to try and um, share my slides. I've got some slides here as sort of visual prompts. So I'll try and share those with everyone. And I'm sure I'll be told if, uh, if they're not, if they're not working, if it's not working. Um, so hopefully those are, those are now visible. And I just put up a picture of myself, not out of vanity, but uh, so you actually put a face to the noise coming through your speakers, um, as well as uh, the, uh, the Zoom link. Uh, so um, what I'd like to do in my, in my sort of 40 minutes, really, is uh, just try and draw out some of the main themes from the book. Uh, and as Deborah said, it was published in March and is actually a revised edition of a, of a book that was published by Yale in 2013. And that was called Northern Ireland, The Reluctant Peace. Uh, as you can see, my subtitles aren't getting any more optimistic, which might uh, be, a, be a sort of point for discussion later on. Um, and Yale wanted to bring it out in paperback uh, for the centenary this year. So Northern Ireland's 100 years old. And I'll get into that during the during the talk itself, uh, and to sort of mark the 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 the, the occasion, uh, Yale wanted to bring out uh, the book. So I spent quite a long time revising it because once I started rereading it, I realised how out of date a lot of the material was in the latter stages of the book. Not so much in the early sections on Irish history, but on the the record of devolved government in Northern Ireland, which the book goes into in detail. So those chapters needed quite an up, up, update. Um, I've also introduced new chapters on Brexit, unsurprisingly, which I'll be saying a lot about, and also about the medium term future looking ahead, uh, you know, post the first hundred years. Uh, what is Northern Ireland's looking, looking at politically over the next decade or so? Uh, so, um, uh, just to uh, see if I have a slide, oh, there we go. So um, really the book is about um, identities and institutions and the political conflict in Northern Ireland is really about contested identities, contested political identities and contested cultural identities. And sometimes it's de depicted internationally or in the, the UK media as a, as a religious war, but it, it certainly isn't a religious war. But it is a war defined by religion, which is a slightly different thing. In other words, religion is the identifier through which you can determine the other people's political and cultural uh, standpoints, or at least you think you can determine that uh, simply by dint of people's religions. So religion is sort of a, a very convenient identifier of, of, a, of an ethno-national division rather than it's certainly not a theological war. And one way I try and explain that is if you were to sort of tackle somebody about transubstantiation, they wouldn't really uh, be too worried or, or, or uh, pick up the argument so much. But if you brandished a flag in their face or if you started talking about um, Irish reunification or your Britishness, then that's where it gets a lot more uh, visceral. And so in other words, it's, Religion is really, you know, it, you shouldn't get confused and think it's actually a war about religion. It certainly isn't. This photograph you can see on the slide here is a sculpture in Derry um, by, a, by somebody called Anthony Gormley, who you're probably familiar with. And there are three life-size sculptures on the walls of Derry, which for me symbolized 
you know, a lot of the issues to do with identity in Northern Ireland. These are, are, are cast iron, life-size casts, one of which faces outwards, one of which faces inwards. And there's three of them at different strategic points on Derry's walls. And they are joined, you know, they're, they're joined at the hip, well, they're joined completely, but they're particularly joined at the hip. Uh, they can never see eye to eye. They can never look through each other's eyes, but they look identical to the outside observer. And to me, that's quite sort of symbolic of some of the issues that we've, that we've had. So the book really maps how our conflicted identities have evolved, and they certainly have evolved and continue to evolve um, and morph. And, and the book then looks at the, the way in which what looked like quite a sort of static political system in the 1950s and 1960s broke down in the 19, late 1960s and, and uh, internationalized as a political issue. And then violence emerged for a generation. So we had 30 years of political violence and then peace. I've got peace in uh, inverted commas a lot of the time, um, really to signify that um, not everybody would, would think of Northern Ireland as being at peace. Uh, but in popular parlance, it, it had a peace process in the 1990s. And that has stumbled along for the last 25 years. And I'll talk about that. And the book talked about that. And really, it's been very difficult to implement this peace process as we've just crawled over the, uh, the 100 year mark that we're still struggling to implement our peace process. Uh, so um, the book's really about this sort of uh, connection, really, of the past and the present and the way in which they all, uh, the, 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 our history and our present can tend to inter interact and uh, bump into it, bump into itself. And there are four sort of key themes in the book, really, that I'd like to try and talk about today. The first one is that we don't have a history, certainly not an accepted narrative in Northern Ireland. We have our, we have histories, we have different histories. Uh, and that's even clear in our education system in Northern Ireland. And I was, I was back in Northern Ireland last week, talking to family and friends, and the topic of integrated education came up. And it may surprise you to know that um, over 90% of children in Northern Ireland go to religiously segregated schools. So over 90% of the of primary and post-primary children go to either state schools that are majority Protestant or um, uh, uh, non-state schools that are majority Catholic. And there is a small integrated sector uh, and that's been around for about 30 or 40 years, but it's still, you know, uh, the poor cousin, really, of the main system. So children really are educated separately. And the history that they get taught in the schools is also, uh, I would say, probably got a different, even if they follow the same curriculum or similar curriculums, the nuances that are put in the, in the curriculums are, I would say, are different. The interpretations of events are different. And so kids grow up, A, not actually meeting children from the other side of the ethno-national division. Uh, certainly at work, in working class urban areas, that would be quite common. Uh, less so in, in middle class areas. Um, and, uh, but secondly, they're, they're, they're sort of, the narrative that they absorb of their history tends to have different nuances in it. Uh, so we've got different readings and, and quite often these are intention you know, uh, Cromwell would be an interesting example of that. The British monarchy, uh, the, uh, the fight for Irish independence at the turn of the 20th century. These sort of big sort of elements of, of, of our history uh, may be contested or may be seen to be uh, in, in tension with each other. The second point, which sort of related to that a little bit, is that issues of legitimacy linked to institutions, the law, the past, or even our present, they're not just a black and white. They're probably more, it's probably better to see them as on a spectrum of legitimacy. They're highly contextual. One example of that might be the police. Uh, now, a, a nationalist perspective on the police in the 1970s, in terms of it, the legitimacy of the criminal justice system, 
and policing uh, would be relatively different, I would, would, would argue, from nationalist views of the police today. Sinn Féin saw the police as an enemy, as part of Crown forces, as a legitimate target. Certainly the provisional IRA saw them as a legitimate target in their armed struggle. Uh, Sinn Féin now sit on the policing board, accept the criminal justice system. Uh, not, not to say they're not critical of it, but they certainly accept it in principle. And so that's an example of the way that the peace process and our institutions ha are, are contextual and issues of legitimacy linked to these things are contextual. Northern Ireland is another very good example. Northern Ireland would have been seen as illegitimate by Irish Republicans right up until relatively recently. Um, you know, a, a partition state. Uh, they wouldn't have called it a country. They wouldn't, you know, sometimes refer to it even as Northern Ireland. It would have been the six counties. It would have been the north of Ireland, uh, you know. Um, uh, but again, the passage of time, the existence of power sharing, the Good Friday agreements, the consent principle that I'll come on to in a second, uh, has made it, has created more space for Republicans and Irish nationalists to certainly accept the, uh, the de facto legitimacy of Northern Ireland and self-determination of people in it. So that's another example, I think, of the way in which these issues they're not just yes and no, they're not just black and white, they're contextual, they exist on a spectrum of opinion. And they, uh, they, I suppose they change in relation to other issues as well. Um, violence on the streets, ceasefires, political institutions, these can all provide space for us to um, slightly change our position on, on the past and on, on law and order and on political institutions as well. Power sharing is another example of that, where in the 1970s, if you're a unionist politician, it would be, you know, political suicide to use the phrase power sharing. Responsibility sharing was the euphemism that was quite often sort of brought into the, the sort of the, the discourse. And um, eventually power sharing, power sharing now is completely unproblematic as a concept for unionist politicians to talk about. But it wasn't 30 years ago. Uh, thirdly, the conflicted history of the last hundred years was not inevitable or hopeless. It was a result of the structural dynamics that we had at the time, as well as ignorance and ambivalence, particularly in Great Britain, over what was happening in Northern Ireland. Uh, Northern Ireland was out of sight, out of mind. Uh, we can get on with our domestic affairs in Great Britain. Uh, that was quite often the attitude of, of uh, the political class in Britain. And as a result of that, things happened in Northern Ireland that couldn't be undone and that didn't have to happen. So simply to say, well, I don't really pay any attention to Northern Ireland, that, you know, they can fight it out amongst themselves or we can get a, you know, we can manage the violence or another sort of euphemism was we get an acceptable level of violence. Well, if you're living in Northern Ireland, no violence is acceptable, but at a political perspective, a level of violence was acceptable. So, um, you know, one of the reasons I suppose that drove me to the book certainly the first edition of it, was uh, frustration with the way in which interest in Northern Ireland only got triggered when violence was on the streets. And you saw that even recently with the riots uh, a few weeks ago. All it took was a few burning buses and like the world's media suddenly turned up. So it's very reactive. Media's attitude towards conflict generally is very reactive, but certainly in Northern Ireland, the understanding of it and interest of it has been very reactive rather than proactive or analytical. Uh, and it, of course, it focuses on the fault line and it quite often doesn't focus on the reasons for the fault line or, or even, you know, good news stories that actually, surprise, surprise, do exist, but rarely get covered. And fourthly, um, politics isn't the preserve of politicians or politics isn't just about the assembly or power sharing or the political parties. Politics, particularly in conflicts, politics is done by everybody, but done by all of us, as is peacemaking. You know, we, we form and reform our social relations and our political relations with each other. And we make peace with each other. So the whole sort of, I suppose, the germ of the peace process was that it wasn't given to us by the British or the, by the Irish governments. 
uh, they played an important role, obviously, but it, you know, it, we voted for it. You know, we voted for um, the peace process in a referendum. In fact, in two referendums, one in Northern Ireland, one in the Irish Republic. So we were part of it. Uh, we were architects of it. We were not just given it. And that's very important, I think, in terms of building a robust peace process. Um, the book goes into looking at politics underneath the level of the formal. And I'm very sort of, I suppose, intellectually committed to the idea that that um, politics is done by all of us, not just by our politicians. Uh, I just want to talk now a little bit about the past. And I have a slide there from uh, Maya Angelou, uh, one of um, the United States' sort of biggest literary figures post-war. And she said this in her inaugural, uh, in, her, in, in uh, Bill Clinton's inaugural address in 1993. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. And it really struck a chord with me that, quote, uh, because we're still struggling in terms of trying not to relive our uh, history, um, try not to have it sort of like Groundhog Day come back and back and back. Uh, and that's a work in progress. You know, you, at times we do sort of catch it and change and evolve, but other times it looks like it's the same old, same old, and nothing's really evolving. And so it's a very good, I think, sort of motto to live by. Don't forget about the history. Try and come to some common agreement about our past and try and learn some lessons from it. And not just people in Northern Ireland, but people in the United Kingdom government, I think, need to take that on board and have a little bit more, um, I don't know, do, a, do an undergraduate course in, in Irish politics or something. Uh, because um, quite often as governments evolve, it seems that they've, they've, um, they've, they, they really don't have a handle on the past in Northern Ireland and, 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 what, and, uh, and, and, and where Northern Ireland has come from over that last hundred years. So I would argue that to understand what's happening in Northern Ireland today, and yesterday, for instance, there was a big march in Portadown in Northern Ireland with um, a lot of people in balaclavas, uh, this is from the sort of loyalist sector of the community complaining about the protocol uh, as a result of the of, of the Brexit process. I don't really think you can understand that unless you have a working knowledge of the past, unless you know you understand where unionism has come from over the last hundred years. Not to necessarily be an, a historian, but at least to have some sort of grip on it. That Northern Ireland came into being kicking and screaming. Uh, unionists had to arm themselves, form a militia, which they called the Ulster Volunteer Force, to resist Home Rule. Then the Home Rule, um, you know, it, it split GB politics for 50 years at the end of the 19th century and the start of the 20th century. And the unionists resisted it through, through threat of violence uh, and because they felt they could not trust the British government. And it worked uh, to a degree, although they ended up with Northern Ireland that was actually not what they wanted in the first place. So the past, you know, it never ceases to provide ironies for the present. It seems to me that quite often you look backwards and, and you see, and you, see uh, you know, um, uh, ironic parallels with what's happening today. But I think you certainly need to, un to understand Brexit. I think you, you, you have to have a understand a little bit about the history of where Northern Ireland came from, where the border came from in Northern Ireland in 1921, and the histories of unionism and nationalism since 1921. Another point is that our past in Northern Ireland seeps into politics and every other aspect of life, including our culture, including our music, our sport, our, our education, as I've mentioned at the start. So it can't, it's not in a container that we sort of open every four or five years at election time. It's, it's there all the time. Uh, you just need to look at the walls, you know, the graffiti. Remember 1690. You know, it's not a, it's, it's, it's not a date that's, um, that's the, the commemoration of the Battle of the Boyne for the uninitiated. Uh, but it, the reason why you don't have, remember the Battle of Bosworth is because, well, maybe you do where you live, but I suspect you probably don't, 
is because, you know, whether Henry VII beat Richard III in the Battle of Osworth has no bearing on whether you support the Labour Party or whether you support the Tories or whether you're a Liberal Democrat. Uh, but in Northern Ireland, the historical battles of the past do have a, you know, they have not become decoupled from our political and cultural allegiances today. So as the past is still connected, it hasn't been sort of decoupled and put into a cultural realm, it's still part of the political system. So I've used, uh, you know, cultural references in the book, particularly poetry and music, to try and illustrate how our culture connects history to our present. Uh, how it helps almost frame our narrative. It's like a, you know, an archive of our history or the history we want to remember. Certainly our music is, and our poetry is as well. Our sense of belonging to place, you know, uh, our sense of frustration, anger, hope, all these other sort of elements. Well, our culture sort of um, captures all of these things very effectively. And a, a political commentator once said, our past is always in front of us in Northern Ireland, which to me was really sort of apt. Uh, we can't shake it off. We don't want to shake it off, um, but we, we can't agree on it either. These are just two pictures of, um, you know, when Brexit happened, uh, first nationalists tried to, you know, have sort of public protest, reminding everybody what the border used to be like you know, 50, 60 years ago. Uh, and more recently, loyalists have been putting up um, banners and yesterday had a parade, a march, uh, of, of the fact that they say no to the Irish Sea border. So everybody's saying no to borders. But the border, you know, the an Irish Sea border was not in the mind's eye of British politicians during the Brexit referendum debate. Northern Ireland was barely in the conversation. Uh, one of the reasons, one of the, well, two reasons for that. One was that the Northern Ireland devolved institutions uh, were having enough problems, and you know we're at the brink of collapse anyway. Um, when the referendum took place, uh, when the when the in out referendum took place in twenty sixteen. Um, they fell shortly after in January 2017, and they were dormant. You know, they were they weren't existing from 2017 until January 2020. So that left Northern Ireland, you know, voiceless in terms of being a devolved institution in a way that Scotland wasn't, for instance. You had political parties active, but then on top of that, you had the British general election in 2017 when Theresa May signed a uh, confidence and supply agreement with the DUP, um, which again, uh, complicated life in Northern Ireland because the largest political party was seen to have an undue influence over the government and in fact, could bring the government down, uh, which then meant that nationalists looked even more uh, mistrustfully at the British government because they felt that they were in hock to the DUP. Uh, so um, our past is always sort of there. I think to understand today why unionists are afraid of the protocol, you've got to look back to other examples. You can't just see it as unreasonable behaviour. To unionists, it's very reasonable behaviour and loyalists, it's very reasonable. Um, it struck me as very similar to the unionist protests of the past, particularly Home Rule and also the Anglo-Irish Agreement of 1985. And in, in the Anglo-Irish Agreement, as you may remember, uh, you may not, but I'll just remind you, uh, Margaret Thatcher, another blonde Tory, um, signed an agreement with the Irish government over the heads of unionists. And they were very unhappy about it. You know, Thatcher, who had taken on the Argentinian government over the Falkland Islands, thousands of miles away, and taken on, you know, the miners and so on, uh, who claimed she was a unionist, suddenly you know stabbed them in the back as they would see it, and so they become so they're they're looking back to these previous crises uh, uh, in terms of how they're responding to the current crisis of Boris Johnson, who also, as far as they're concerned, stabbed them in the back or stabbed them in the front actually, 
And um, the emotion of this was really, I think you can capture it if you look at some some poetry, which I'm going to inflict on you now. Uh, well, you're lucky to look. I won't, I won't, uh, I won't uh, give you too much of it. But it was a poem written by John Hewitt directly in response to the Anglo-Irish Agreement in 1985. John Hewitt is one of Northern Ireland's best poets and best known poets. Uh, he's a Protestant poet. Uh, not that he would define himself in that way, but that's sort of the side of the fence that he came from, liberal Protestantism. And um, here's just some pictures of the, of the 1985 period. You've got Paisley and Peter Robinson, Ulster Says No, uh, big mass demonstrations back in 1985 and 1986. And a big, big well-publicized campaign against the Anglo-Irish Agreement back then. And that's a picture of John Hewitt at the bottom left there. And uh, the poem is, these days the air is thick with bitter cries as baffled thousands dream they are betrayed, stripped of the comfort of safe loyalties, their ancient friends considered enemies, alone among the nations and afraid. And that could just as easily be written about the protocol now for me as it was written about the anglo Irish Agreement then, that they, there is an unrequited love issue between the Unionists and the British. They've never felt quite as British as the people in Great Britain. Team GB, is called that for a reason. It's not just marketing. Uh, it's, it's not Team UK. And Brexit was the same. You know, it was it was all about Britain. It was all about England, actually. It wasn't about Northern Ireland, even though the DUP supported it, uh, supported it very strongly once the referendum took place. Not so much during the campaign itself, I would say. But there is this existential angst amongst unionists about the degree to which the British are fair weather friends of the Union, or even if they care about it even that much, that when push comes to shove, British governments are prepared to be pragmatic about the Union. And I think it's a reasonable argument to say that the current British government have wanted Brexit more than they've wanted the Union, uh, because they've also jeopardised the Union in Scotland, as well as the Union in Northern Ireland, to get Brexit done. And Boris, I'll get on to this in a second, but Boris Johnson effectively, you know, uh, introduced a border in the Irish Sea to get Brexit done. So, in other words, there's a continuity here uh, for the unionists and for the nationalists between the past and the present. It's not just now, it's also connected to struggles of yesteryear. And you can connect this one to Home Rule similarly. And so we've now got these existential insecurities. And that's a picture of David Campbell, who's leader of a, a group called the LCC, which is, if you like, a front of house for uh, Republic, uh, for loyalist paramilitary groups. The DUP are now talking to the LCC, uh, engaging with them. Engaging is a very elastic word. It could mean either listening and you know fact finding, or it could mean sympathising. Now, yesterday, there were 800 people in Portadown, many of them wearing balaclavas, and it wasn't for social distancing and COVID reasons. Uh, it was a show of strength. It was a threat. But David Campbell and, and, and others are saying, well, it's a warning, not a threat. OK, we're warning, we're not threatening. Now, the difference between a warning and a threat, if you're on the receiving end of it, may be, you know, in the eye of the beholder. Um, Ian Paisley, Jr., this was in February this year, said the protocol has betrayed us, made us feel like foreigners in our own country. Prime Minister, be the union as we need you to be. All very dramatic stuff. But unfortunately, Boris Johnson will never be the unionist Ian Paisley wants him to be. Because he doesn't care about the union as much as he cares about domestic issues. So, uh, and if he had, he wouldn't have done what he did. Uh, so, um, this is David Campbell's quote from May this year. We definitely could creep over into violence. I describe this as probably, you know, the most dangerous situation for many years, but I do hope common sense will prevail. Of course, everybody hopes for common sense as long as you do what they want you to. So the degree to which these are threats or warnings or good advice, uh, of course, will depend on the point of your point of view. Um, so we're now, as you can see, I've just picked that Brexit lantern there. It's a bit unseasonal, but very good for me. Um, ominous Brexit looking uh, symbol. We're just past the centenary. We're a month into the second century. How far will Northern Ireland get in its current form? I think Brexit makes that a legitimate question now. Brexit is now up there. 2016 is one of those dates in our calendar. 
you know, in our chronology. 1921, Northern Ireland was created. 1968, when politics broke down and violence really started, civil rights movement kicked off and violence started taking place. 1972, when the first devolved majority rule parliament was abolished by the British government, by London just pulling the plug on it. 1985, when the Anglo-Irish Agreement, it really internationalized Northern Ireland diplomatically with the Anglo-Irish Agreement. 1998, we had the Good Friday Agreement. 2016, we had Brexit, and now we've got the centenary. And I think now there is a, you know, an issue about how far will Northern Ireland get in its current status. Now, the Northern Ireland office and, and, and some British politicians have been trying to sort of sell this as a marketing opportunity. And some wanted to cheer, but unionists really, since the protocol, you know, it's, it's tasted like ashes in their mouths, a lot of this centenary. They don't really feel in a party mood. They've just lost Arlene Foster, you know, the leader of the DUP formerly. Uh, so they, uh, you know, there's a lot of angst amongst unionists that didn't really make them feel very much in a party spirit. Republicans see nothing to celebrate. And if you, I don't know where you are living in, if you're in Britain or another country, but if somebody drew a line across your country and said, you're now in a different country, you probably wouldn't think it's, a, you know, 100 years later, a big party time. And people in Great Britain really didn't know or didn't care one way or the other about this. And interestingly, there were, you know, there were celebrations and broadcasts about um, uh, the 100 year centenary, but it was only broadcast in Northern Ireland. And you think, well, this is a bit weird that, you know, that this big outreach Northern Ireland centenary thing is, is, is been given to everybody who already know about it, some of whom don't want it anyway, but it's not really newsworthy enough to tell anybody else about it. So 1998 then was the big sort of, I want to talk a little bit about this, the, the, the Good Friday Agreements and the, you know, the compromise. And that's exactly what the peace process was. It was a compromise. It was not yes, and it was not no, it was maybe. It was an ugly, you know, an ugly child, to some degree. And it was based on this phrase, constructive ambiguity. Who knows where we'll be 20 years down the line, but for, for tomorrow, let's just get on with looking at our, our um, you know, health service and our education service and normal politics. Let's set up some north-south bodies that can grow over time on the basis of consent, the consent of the parties in Northern Ireland. Um, it was the space between yes and no, right? That was what it was. And of course we voted for it. Our civil society organizations supported it. Uh, it parked the final political destination of Northern Ireland as being British or being Irish. It parked that for another day. It left some things out of it because they were too difficult to negotiate. The, the weapons decommissioning issue, the future of policing, those were dealt with subsequently in subsequent years. It was voted for and given a big mandate. This is when referendums were, were good, we think, if, you, if you're a Remainer. Um, if you're a Lever, you probably think they're still good. Uh, so 71% of people in Northern Ireland voted to for the Good Friday Agreement or the Belfast Agreement. And 95% of people in the Irish Republic voted for it, but they also had to change the constitution, which they did, to make the United Ireland desire more, more of an aspiration. They watered down the, the United Ireland dimension of the constitution. And um, really had this balancing act between whether we're accommodating our differences and our sectarianism and our, our different viewpoints, or whether we're actually reconciling them. Are we in silos, you know, or are we on tram lines that just are continuing to go in parallel, or are we actually merging? And uh, there's been a debate about the capacity of power sharing in Northern Ireland uh, to do this. Can it work in theory? Uh, is it just actually institutionalizing sectarianism? I would argue not, but others have argued that it does. Can it work in practice? Is it just the practice of, of power sharing that's the problem? If power sharing isn't viable, is there something else that can work? The book is, is certainly a critical friend of power sharing. Uh, I think that uh, if you're looking for a consensus-based negotiated settlement, you have to deal with the, uh, you know, the, the, the political viewpoints and the political temperature that you've got in front of you. And it would be very ambitious to try and wish that away and, 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 and bring in you know, a different type of political system that nobody actually wanted. But it's certainly a bumpy road. It's certainly been dysfunctional and it will continue being so. 
But you could argue that, you know, uh, if you're to look at the current political system in the United States during the Trump era, or if you're to look at the fact that, you know, Boris Johnson tried to prorogue parliament illegally and then misled the head of state, then actually maybe Northern Ireland is not quite so bad. So um, the book's dedicated to Lyra McKee. That's Lyra McKee there in the picture. She was a 29-year-old journalist. She was born during the peace process. She was killed by the peace process in that, you know, a dissident Republican shot her in a riot in Derry in 2019. And for me, and she was a very progressive person, she talked about, you know, stories that weren't just about the political elites and the rich and powerful. She actually delved into, in her journalism, into like real people, what was happening on the ground. And that's what her stories tended to be about. And for me, Leora McKee was a, was a vision of, of the future we could have had in Northern Ireland, and we still can have, actually, rather than the past that we actually did have. And the picture at the bottom is from her uh, funeral, uh, which you may have seen on television, and all the great and the good gathered. Um, this actually became a, 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 a catalyst for the restoration of the political system in Northern Ireland. And the priest on the altar said, why in God's name does it take the death of a 29-year-old woman with her whole life in front of her to get to this point? In other words, the politicians, the local politicians sitting down and talking. And people said, the honesty of that, you know, the, the rationality of that just could not be argued with. And it did sort of push them back. They said they weren't embarrassed back into government, but they really were, in my view. It was certainly the, well, they wanted back in, but not, you know, unless the other side moved. So there was a, a desire to get back into government, but it certainly was a catalyst for them to do so. Um, and that's the and that's the canon. I've actually got a, a quote from at the, in the introduction of the book from Lear McKean, where she wrote, Northern Ireland is a beautiful tragedy, strangled by the chains of its past and its present. It's a place full of darkness and mysteries. It's also my home. And that for a lot of us is the is the frustration that you know, we've got all these tensions, but at the end of the day, it's where we're from and the place we love the most. And how do we disentangle without sort of trying to ride roughshod over people's legitimate grievances? And we're still struggling to do that. So we're a quarter of a century in. Uh, power sharing uh, has existed off and on, but it hasn't really tackled sectarianism there. It hasn't provided sufficient incentives for us to cooperate across the ethno-national divide uh, is provided more reasons for people to resist change than actually change. It's been very good at stopping really things that you really don't want happening. It's been quite good at that because it's, there's a mutual veto in the system, but it's much less nimble at effective governance at progressive leadership. It's not so good at that. Um, and one of the reasons for that is because the Good Friday Agreement, all of the devolved government structures and the assembly and the power sharing executive, they allow us to agree to differ with each other. But they don't actually, we haven't agreed to agree yet. Uh, it doesn't really provide us with much of an incentive structure to move forward in agreement. <clears throat> now, back in 1998, Tony Blair gave a press conference just as the Good Friday Agreement was, was reached on the 10th of April. And he said, the essence of what we have agreed is a choice. We're all winners or all losers. It's mutually assured benefit or mutually assured destruction. And um, he thought we'd go for mutually assured benefit, uh, but it, it's not a binary. You know, we're, we're, Northern Ireland has got both of these things simultaneously. Uh, and peace processes generally move like that. You know, They're not, it's not an either or. And now, of course, we've got new problems. Brexit really is the is at the vanguard of that. Um, the peace process was built on this constructive ambiguity, and and Brexit gives us either or. And the last thing you need in a conflict environment is an either or, yes or no, good or bad. Uh, you need you know the space between A and B. Uh, it was also built on the consent principle that people in Northern Ireland, uh, you know that the, the that they would remain as they were until a majority of people in Northern Ireland wanted something else. And they and it was them who would determine their future, their political future, people of Northern Ireland. 
Um, the problem with Brexit is that it, it, it cuts through this constructive ambiguity. It provides a clarity. You're in or you're out. You have to be on one side or the other side. It forces us into those trenches when what we need to be is in the, you know, the gray area. Um, which is not to say that necessarily we all need to be in the middle politically, but we need to at least think that uh, what we hold valuable will still be achieved or can still be achieved through the political system. And of course, it, um, it squeezed the space for nationalists who claimed that Northern Ireland was unique, it was different from the rest of the UK, and unionists who claimed it was integral to the UK and part of the country. The country's leaving the EU that our country is leaving the EU. Now, of course, nationalists say, well, we don't, we're, not in, we're not in that country. We're in Ireland. The Good Friday Agreement actually facilitates us being Irish, not British. And suddenly after Brexit, they were told they were British. And that's where this clarity becomes problematic. It also raised a thorny question about self-determination. Now, of course, Brexit was not devolved to the Northern Ireland Assembly, but the whole ethos of the peace process, the whole ethos of the, good, of the institutions was about the consent principle. Now, I haven't mentioned it yet, but 56% of people in Northern Ireland voted remain, only 44 voted leave. Of that, about 88 to 90% of nationalists voted remain, and about 38% of unionists voted remain. So the point being there that um, they were told they were leaving, even though overall the majority of Northern Ireland voted to remain. So you can see that the sort of it became clear that self determination counted for very little, and that uh, it was London that called the shots. And the Vol government has sort of hidden that slightly, but Brexit made that clear. That's uh, on the right hand side is a picture I actually took yesterday on my journey back from uh, from Northern Ireland in in Rathfry Island. Uh, hello to anybody from Rathfry Island who's, who's watching. Um, and, you know, in other words, it's, you know, the, the, the Irish sea border. They're saying, no, that's on the left hand side is, is Boris Johnson's oven ready Brexit deal, I think. That was the photo op. Uh, but it hasn't seemed very oven ready to, uh, to unionists and loyalists. And if it, if it was oven ready, it, certainly the ingredients are pretty appalling as far as they're concerned. He got Brexit done by imposing a trade border in the Irish Sea. It was not done by the Irish government. This was done by the London government, by the unionist government who they're loyal to, and by Brussels. You know, it was part of the negotiation, and Boris Johnson was fully aware of the fact that that's what he was doing. Uh, it wasn't the Brexit unionists thought they were getting. Uh, it's energised, on the other side, the campaign for a border poll and Irish reunification, Bre the whole Brexit process, which is, again, sort of scaring unionists that, that, you know, that they're looking at the end game of the union. It makes the case of the union more difficult for unionists, I think, in that they've now got a trade border in the Irish Sea. They've got a British government that's ditched them at the last minute, as far as they're, they would argue, betrayed them. Um, and why would you tie yourself politically to a government that continually betrays you? You know, that's the, that's the problem that they're going to have to make once they have to sort of sell the union in the, you know, in the years ahead. And that's not helpful. Just want to finish, because I'm trying to run out of time now. I want to finish by talking about Anglo-Irish relations. And they, they were very warm up, up to 2016 from the peace process. There's a picture there of the Queen meeting Martin McGuinness, former commander of the IRA. Um, and the state visits. Uh, the Queen visited Ireland, the Irish Republic, and the President of Ireland visited uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, and even though these are symbolic events, symbolism still matters. And they were, you know, a, sen a sense of normalization. And that has, uh, that has changed quite dramatically since 2016. And uh, it's because the interests of Ireland and the interests of the United Kingdom are now diverging gradually. And of course, the negotiations stretched this relationship. And these were absolutely crucial to the peace process. The fact that Northern Ireland was jointly managed, you know, by both governments, that both of them uh, were in sort of tandem as being co-guarantors of the peace process. Um, there were the foundations really to it, and you know, if you if you if you go to you know uh, where the swanky houses are in wherever you live, you're probably not going to go and look at those and say, 
Look at the lovely foundations on that building. Really beautiful. Really structurally sound. You're not going to do that. You're going to say, look at the lovely you know, garden in there and the, the balcony there and the beautiful picture window. Uh, but if the, if the foundations weren't there, the house would be in the garden. So they're very important. And what worries me is that unless Anglo-Irish relations improve significantly, that's going to be another thing that, pro that, that undermines stability in Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, that's, I think, something to watch and something to worry about. There's an assembly election scheduled for 2022. It may happen earlier. Uh, we'll talk about that in the discussion if you want. We, the assembly will have to vote on the protocol or certain sections of the protocol's continuation in 2024. So we're going to be arguing about the protocol for the foreseeable future rather than about education or as well as education, the health system, the management of public services, etc. And that's going to destabilize relationships there. Finishing some good news. Public health has been one of the success stories where the, the where actually devolved government has, has been very effective. Robin Swan, who's the guy on the left, is our health minister, a unionist. But nobody really talks about the fact he's a unionist. They say he's actually been pretty good on COVID. And I'm getting this from nationalists and unionists. Um, the, the virus didn't discriminate on religion. It would kill you if you're a nationalist or a unionist. Uh, or it may have discriminated on class, but that's a separate problem. But it certainly didn't discriminate on whether we're unionist or nationalist. And um, it was one of the few examples where the government in Northern Ireland, the DUP and Sinn Féin, apart from a few squabbles, really saw everybody as equally valuable, equally important to vaccinate as many as possible, regardless of whether they're unionist or nationalist. And it's been the one thing that's really, you know, brought them together and possibly even meant that the thing has survived up until now, when there were things that could have probably destroyed it over the last year or so. Um, so it's fragile peace. Brexit has led to Arlene Foster's resignation, who's head of the DUP. Devolved governments, even as probably as fragile as it's ever been. We've got a, we don't know who the next first minister is going to be, probably until next week. Um, we don't know whether that's going to be a viable relationship with the Deputy First Minister and Sinn Féin. Border poll calls will continue and probably intensify. We're probably going to have a border poll in Northern Ireland and a referendum in Scotland over the next decade. I would say I'd put 50p on that one. Uh, we are likely to focus on the union or unification just as much as these day-to-day -day issues for the foreseeable. Um, you know, we're evolving, looking ahead. Uh, I just want to sort of finish on, on one sort of irony, really, is that we do have a 15% of the electorate in Northern Ireland who are non-aligned one way or the other. And it's probably going to be the undecideds who decide uh, Northern Ireland's ultimate political destiny uh, over the next 10 or 15 years. So I'll just sort of say thank you, and I'll stop talking now. If you want to buy the book, there's a link there to it. It's 11.99 paperback, and there's photos. So um, that's a bargain in anybody's language. And so uh, I'll leave it there and maybe we'll have some uh, Q&A now. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Cochrane. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, and also, we this has sort of stimulated a lot of thoughts amongst our attendees as well, because we have quite a long list of uh, questions already. Um, I've got one from William Green. And what I'll do, William, is I'll switch you on so that you can speak and then you can ask the questions. William actually has three questions, which is a lot, but I will, uh, if I could, William, um, can I ask you to go through them fairly quickly so that, um, uh, that somebody else has a, ta a chance as well? Here you go, William. Hello, as someone brought up as a Manchester Catholic, Irishness is part of my background. And it's always struck me that what you've got in this situation are three frightened minorities. A frightened Protestant, a Catholic minority in Northern Ireland, a frightened Protestant minority in Ireland, and a frightened Catholic minority in the British Isles. And it's that frightenedness, that fear. Number two, religion is declining in Northern Ireland as elsewhere. It's virtually disappeared in Glasgow, and yet Celtic and Ranger supporters still continue to scream sectarian hatred at each other and ask to be placed in different council estates. Will it become tribal rather than religious? And number three, the figures show that Catholics are growing in numbers. 
if they become a majority, will there be a hard push to a united Ireland? Sorry, I, I think the questions are related. Thanks very much, Thank you William. So much for your brevity, William. It's really appreciated. Yeah, go on, Fergal. Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks, William. Those are great questions, actually, and I think they are interrelated. Um, I think that the, I think, I think your point about uh, insecurity, I would call it, rather than being frightened, but certainly. Yes, these pop these groups are insecure, and when you're insecure, you tend to hang on for dear life. It's very difficult for insecure groups to strategize about the future in an optimistic mindset. And so you're absolutely right. If you are insecure, and I would say that these groups are insecure, probably not the only insecure ones. I would also say that that the political class in the Irish Republic are also worried and insecure about being faced with having to absorb this insecure Protestant population in the North into a new country, into a new Ireland. And that's causing, you know, worrying them about having, you know, unionists who don't want to be there sort of shuffled in. So when you're insecure, you try and hang on. And I think that one of the tasks that we've got is to try and build trust uh, in the system and build trust. And that's where the political leaders, I think, have to try and, you know, do something to help achieve that. But we're, we're going to probably not get too further forward unless we build trust and build political space within these groups where they're not afraid of the future. And if you're afraid of the future, you resist the future. Uh, if you're confident about the future, you embrace it. And it's, you know, it's trying to get towards the confidence that we need to do. We need to do something like current events would not give me much optimism on that one. The, on the relig declining religious thing, you're absolutely right about that. Religious observance is declining. Um, but as I said earlier, this is not a theological issue. Uh, religious observance is declining, but people will still call themselves Protestants and Catholics because it, when you called it tribal, I would call it more of a, a sort of ethnic Catholics and ethnic Protestants, as I think Brendan O'Leary, a political scientist, referred to. It. You know, it's it's um, it's an ethnicity, the religion. It's a badge. It's not an observance of our theology. And I think that, in other words, the power of religion will remain as an ethnicity, not as a theology. Uh, the po third point about Catholic population, yes, the Catholic, well, we've just had a census, so we'll find out in due course about the, the, the you know, the religious balance. Um, I would think that there would be a big sector of, that would define themselves as no religion there, but certainly the Catholic population is expanding. But I would say that that has very little significance in terms of uh, the um, political complexion, because I think a lot will depend on the extent to which the union can be made attractive to Catholics, so the status quo can be made attractive. In other words, I can be Irish and a Catholic in the, in the union. Uh, that's, that's the job unionists have got to do, you know, to try and make that argument. Um, if we're in a sort of a post-Brexit Tory rule forever, uh, you know, English rule forever, uh, Scotland leaving the union out of the EU, all of those things might push the Catholic population towards a unification agenda, but none of those are religious. So that's the way I would sort of see that Catholic population dynamic happening. So I'm sure there's others that want to get in on that, but that's the way I would answer those. Uh, the next question is from uh, John Dowdle. I'm just going to um, switch you on, John, so that you can ask the question yourself. Oh, there you are. You there? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, this is my question, Fergal. Um, cannot Northern Ireland be perceived as a failed example of the former British Empire policy of colonialism, similar to that followed in British Mandate Palestine, but that the Zionists were more successful in getting greater support from British and American imperialism whereas the Unionists in Northern Ireland never got the level of imperialist support that the Zionists were able to gain. And secondly, long term, will not Northern Ireland be absorbed into the Irish Republic? So two questions there. Okay, great questions, John. Thanks for those. Um, uh, certainly, you know, Northern Ireland was the creation of the British government, right? And uh, the Anglo-Irish Treaty in 1921 set it up, but it wasn't, I would say it wasn't a, an ideal, and maybe this is the same in, in Palestine as well, but it wasn't an ideological goal. It was a, 
it was the least worst option. It was a it was a post colonial um, death throw, and um, it was to try and avoid a civil war in Ireland that they that partitioned the island, and effectively in a very sort of Benthamite type way kept most northern Protestants in Northern Ireland in the six counties of Ulster, not the nine counties. Six counties was chosen because it was numerically superior. Nine counties would have been too equal and therefore destabilized. So uh, it was it was it drew a line relatively, um, you know, uh, bluntly. They set up a boundary commission to decide on that. So there's a bit of sort of jiggery pokery. 1921, they set up a boundary commission. The idea of that, the British government then said to nationalists in Ireland, you can vote in your county and vote into the Irish Free State. Uh, that was never allowed in the end, but it was a good way of getting nationalists to sign up to the treaty in 1921. Uh, 1925, the border was just ratified. Um, was Is it the same as, as Israel and Palestine? Certainly, I would agree that it didn't have the same level of uh, international um, buy-in or support. Or, you know, but part of that, I think, was because you know, it was within the United Kingdom. It was still domestic, whereas uh, it wasn't a foreign policy issue. And of course, Britain was very keen to keep uh, other countries out of its domestic foreign affairs, uh, certainly post-1969. So uh, I wouldn't see them as identical. I see them, maybe the roots of both as similar, uh, yes. Uh, but, I, 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 uh, but I think that it's a bit comparing apples and oranges because the fact that Northern Ireland was actually part of the United Kingdom and the other one wasn't. Um, it, it, Britain also did try to uh, do to, to provide a political system that would be as 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 uh, uh, fair to the nationalist minority in Northern Ireland. For instance, it introduced proportional representation in elections, both in local elections and in Stormont, uh, because it wanted to try and maximise nationalist buy-in, ma ma nationalist support to this new entity. Um, it didn't think that PR was needed in Great Britain, and unionists eventually got rid of PR in 1929. So. So that's that one. Uh, I don't know if that's answered that to your satisfaction, but will it be absorbed in the long term in the Irish Republic? Well, that's the key. That's the $64,000 question we're in now. Where is Northern Ireland going? My best guess on it is that, that um, we are, will end up with an Ireland that doesn't look like the Irish Republic, that we're going to end up in some third space, uh, and that, that, the, that there will be a sort of a gradual... If you look at post-Brexit economics, as an example, the economic connections between the Irish Republic and Northern Ireland are growing massively because of problems between trade, between GB and Northern Ireland. Um, and there are just natural connections anyway. Um, I think that, that the Irish Republic will change in a way, in, a, in this sort of environment down the line that, that, that may have closer ties to the North and it may happen through consent, and it may happen through natural cooperation. If we get this confidence amongst unionists that it's in their interest to do this, and of course it has the it has the European Union membership as the as one of the uh, as one of the, the sort of the payoffs of doing that. But we'll we'll have to see where that one goes. But uh, I think we're looking at quite a long timeline for that to happen, and I don't see any real sort of desire on the Irish Republic side to do this in any way quickly. Um, you know, in fact, the reverse is the case. You know, I think that they're now worried about, as I said, about the implications of a border pole forcing their hand and, and absorbing a unionist quickly. And they're trying to slow that down, I think, and, and think about it and, and, and actually think about it in a way that they didn't in Brexit. Brexit, they had a vote and then thought, what do we do next? Uh, I think the Irish government, and not just the Irish government, but lots of other parties, Sinn Féin included, and the unionists are trying to think about, well, if this did happen, you know, what would we need? What would we want? What would the offer be? What would the questions be? There's a lot of thinking, you know, needed before we get to that stage. Sorry, very long answer to your question, but they're very good questions. Um, the next question is from Sarah Vaughan. Sarah Vaughan, you're oh. unmuted. Can you? you? You need to unmute at your end as well. The button is just on the lower left hand side of your screen, Sarah. There you go. Hello. Um, I did send this in uh, <clears throat> to Deborah, but uh, I wanted to say that I lived in Northern Ireland. I uh, went to Queen's University 
in uh, 1979 through 81 and had a kind of up close view of the worst of the situation at the time in many ways. Um, it struck me at the time, uh, two things. The educators among whom I worked and researched and learned um, seemed almost equally biased as the people in the street. And that, that I found profoundly disturbing. Um, but I had a little understanding of the long history of the separation of people in Northern Ireland. And I wondered at the time, they talked mostly amongst themselves about trying to bring up children in mixed schools and uh, teaching them a general narrative, uh, getting away from uh, segregated communities where people had many more uh, mixed relationships and friendships amongst the community themselves. And that the siloing of these social relationships was contributing long-term. And I wondered what you think at the moment of the of whether this is moving on in any progress or whether you think that there's still a terrifically culturally siloed population. Uh, great, well, uh, hello, Sarah, and thanks for the question. And that's uh, it's a great question. In fact, it's a question I was talking about last week when I was in Northern Ireland to friends. Um, and I think both of these things are actually there. But like I said, you know, it's not an either or. I think we've got elements of, of continuity of, you know, our divisions are still there and they're going to continue being there simultaneously with sporadic evidence of change. So as an example, there are schools holding referendums on converting themselves into integrated schools. There was a referendum in Belfast of a school community a couple of weeks ago. I think it might've been in Glengormley, I'm not sure, but as 86% of parents voted to integrate the school in, ter in terms of its religious composition, Catholic and Protestant. So there are pockets of uh, what you might call progressive tendencies there over the education system, but that's happening within a, I think is the way I would see it with, um, you know, an overarching structural division of the society. You know, we've, we're still very piecemeal and it's still, you know, the, 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 the outlier rather than the norm that you're getting this. But nonetheless, it's happening. It's quite difficult for these, for schools to begin as an integrated school. And there's still an awful lot of mistrust um, over, uh, 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 mistrust and lack of opportunity because Housing is also very, as you probably know, you know, people uh, uh, in urban areas, apart from some, there's still a lot of segregated living. And therefore to find an integrated school, you know, is, is a big task. There, there's a lack of availability and lack of capacity. So um, it's a real debate going on really about, about whether this is something that should be done from the top downwards or whether it's something that should be growing upwards from, from grassroots communities. Um, there's also a lot of suspicion over how these schools would reflect the cultural uh, and, uh, you know, cult I suppose the cultural and political narratives of both unionist and nationalist communities. Nationalists are worried that if, if Catholics, Catholic schools were, you know, they provided Catholic children with education and a knowledge of their history when state schools didn't fill the gap, as far as they would be concerned. Um, there's a worry that an integrated school is really a state school by another name. You know, would it really teach Irish history? Would the nuances be there for that to happen? And there's a, a real reticence. So people will say, if you survey them, of course, we're committed to integrated education, to our kids being, being educated together. It doesn't make any sense not to do that. But they, they tend not to walk the talk a lot of the time for very understandable reasons, it, because the short term, uh, they worry about, do, about, the, about the price of doing that. So I would say that both of these things are still there in Northern Ireland. You've got progressive upshoots happening sp sporadically, but the overarching picture is still one of a massively divided society. 
Professor Fergal Cochrane, thank you ever so much. It's been very, very interesting. And I think it's um, helped us to understand an awful lot of the subtleties of a situation which gets written uh, in very sort of monochrome terms uh, just in the news. It's, it's a lot more subtle um, and historically dependent than that. Uh, remember that Professor Cochrane's um, book is available now. It's been available since March. Um, and thank you ever so much to everybody who attended today. As you know, Conway Hall is the oldest ethical society in the UK. We put on talks, we put on events, and we are a charity. We do this um, entirely with money that you send us. I know that the last year has been rough on everybody. If it hasn't been rough on you and you could afford even a small donation, we would very, very much appreciate it. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Bye-bye. <laughs>